New York City is reporting more than 36,000 cases of coronavirus over the last seven-day period, which has hospitals operating at near capacity. Between 75 and 80 percent of hospital beds are filled right now. Mayor Eric Adams unveiled a plan to provide more than $130 million to combat COVID. Our public hospitals have been first line defense against COVID and these dollars will give them the resources that they need from being hit hard with the pandemic. And these funds will support our hospitals addressing staffing shortages and major issues, pump up baseline staffing, including doctors, nurses, medical technicians, and support workers. And it will the city's hotspots where the most positive number of cases have been reported are on Staten Island, the Bronx, and Queens. New York City Health Commissioner Dr. Dave Choksi joining us this morning to discuss the city's COVID response. So good morning to you, Commissioner. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Dan. Hi, Hazel. So we have a lot of COVID questions for you, but let me first begin with those funds that the mayor just addressed right there, that Mayor Adams announced yesterday, right? How is it going to be distributed, right? I think that's what a lot of hospitals are wondering. Who's on the priority of getting that money first? Yes, well, first, I'm really grateful to the mayor for taking swift action. Uh, our hospitals are under some strain right now because of the combination of an influx of patients and uh, some staff uh, who are out sick um, because of, of uh, Omicron, because of COVID-19 itself. So this funding uh, is really dedicated to our safety net hospitals, uh, health and hospitals, uh, which is our public system, uh, as well as independent safety net hospitals, and it will help to shore them up, particularly with respect to staffing. Mm. All right, well, getting back to the numbers, the daily positivity and hospitalization rates for New York City, it's really alarming. More than 5,000 New Yorkers were admitted to hospitals just on Tuesday, and that's the highest dating back to May of 2020. So how high are you expecting those numbers to go, especially given the fact that we're also at the peak of the flu season? Yes, we are seeing unprecedented numbers with respect to cases and percent positivity. Our hospitalization numbers have increased in recent days and weeks. There are about 5,700 patients who are currently hospitalized in New York City. To put that into context, that's still less than half of the number of COVID patients that were hospitalized during spring of 2020, but is still a very significant number. I do expect particularly the number hospitalized to continue going up uh, for the coming days and perhaps weeks. Uh, and this is why it's so important for everyone to take the steps that we can right now yeah. to support healthcare workers. Get your booster shot if you haven't yet. Vaccinate your child. Get tested. Wear a mask and <clears throat> optimally a high quality mask. Um, and do the other things that we know can help to so, curb the spread. Let me talk to you about the testing then for a second here, right? Because uh, we talked to Dr. Fauci on Monday right here on this program. He said he expected to go up really, really quickly and then hopefully come down by the end of the month in terms of a surge like they saw in South Africa. But you mentioned testing here, and a lot of folks are having trouble with understanding how it's all working and what a, a, a rapid test can detect versus a PCR. A lot of people are saying, I took a rapid. I was negative, and then I took a PCR, and I was positive. So what do you recommend here? Yes, so first, PCR tests are more sensitive uh, than rapid tests, but both play an important role. And the most important thing is, if you're having symptoms, uh, get tested uh, with you know one of the tests that's available to you. If you test negative on a rapid test, but you're still having symptoms, I do recommend that you seek a PCR test at that point because it may be that you're uh, just at too early a stage in your illness for it to be picked up on the rapid But is test. a rapid, Dr. Choksi, not as good at detecting Omicron as a PCR? Uh, well, rapid tests in general are uh, just not quite as good, meaning not quite as sensitive as PCR, whether for Omicron or any other variant of COVID-19. Uh, there is some, you know, very early data showing that particularly in the earliest phases of illness with Omicron, rapid tests may not be quite as sensitive. Um, and so that's why in those cases, I do recommend if you're having symptoms, um, go ahead and get the PCR test as well. And speaking of symptoms, people still don't know, like, am I having a COVID reaction or response here or, or, or is it a flu? So there are reports of patients being infected with a combination of flu and COVID symptoms, and it's now being dubbed flurona. So have there been any confirmed cases of what they're calling flurona in New York City? 
Um, yes, but again, this is not something that's new. You know, we see uh, what we call co-infection with respiratory viruses uh, like the flu and coronavirus all the time. So undoubtedly, you know, there will be cases uh, of co-infection of influenza and COVID-19. Um, but the important thing, and you know, if I can turn fluorona on its head for a moment, is we have good vaccines for both. And you can actually get both of those at the same time. Uh, so the best protection against both influenza and COVID-19 is to get vaccinated. But just to clarify, you have confirmed cases of fluorona, both flu and COVID combined in New York City? Uh, I'm not aware of specific cases at this moment, but I would not be surprised if they exist in New York City. So I want to talk about the nearly 13,000 positive COVID cases reported in New York City schools, right? And some parents are, are struggling to understand with case numbers going up that you're still maintaining it's the safest place for students to be. So why is that? And where is there a threshold where you might recommend that schools go back to being remote? Yes, well, it's important to clarify the cases that are reported at schools are uh, usually not because of transmission that is occurring in schools. Uh, most of the transmission that we're seeing is in community and household settings. Uh, and that's true across all age ranges, but it includes, you know, for our kids and for school staff as well. Um, schools are among the safest places in our communities, mm -hmm. and that's because of the prevention measures that we've put in place. Uh, everyone is required to be vaccinated. Uh, there's a mask mandate in place. We've worked on improving ventilation and distancing, and we've added even more testing at the beginning uh, of this uh, school year. Um, so all of these things in concert do help us to make uh, schools yeah. safer. In certain cases, when we do see widespread transmission in schools, uh, we will take the requisite steps that we need to uh, to close schools for a temporary period of time. Uh, but the most important thing is that uh, we have to get our kids safely back into schools right. because it's important for their learning and their health. And can we ask you real quickly, uh, the newly approved Pfizer booster shots for kids, how soon do you think that we'll have that here in the city? Yes, well, this is great news. Uh, the FDA and the CDC have both authorized it uh, for 12 to 15 year olds. Um, we're waiting on uh, some clinical guidance today and we'll train all of our staff on those protocols. And I expect as soon as tomorrow at city sites, uh, we will be administering boosters for 12 to 15 year olds as well. News. Remember, this is five months after right. uh, the second dose of Pfizer uh, for anyone 12 and up. That's great news, Dr. Choksi. And we're out of time here, but I do want to squeeze in one more question here. A lot of things circulate on social media and mm -hmm. a lot of people get their news from social media. And there's this whole idea of swabbing your throat to find out if you actually have COVID right now and they're doing it overseas. What's the situation here? Do you recommend people swab their throat or is it still a nasal swab? No, I don't recommend that you swab your throat if that's not the way that the test was designed. And most of the tests are either nasal swabs, what's called a nasopharyngeal swab, um, which goes a little bit deeper into the nose or a saliva test. So this is something that scientists need to clarify, you know, whether a throat swab uh, will be helpful, uh, but it needs to be validated and go through the studies for us to do that. So use the test in the way that it was validated. Um, and that's what I recommend right now. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Choksi. We always appreciate your time here on the show. Thanks for having me. All right.